Well, hey guys, thanks for tuning in to the Straight Out of Prison podcast. My name is James K. Jones, and this is my story. And this is Haley Jones, and this is his story that has now become a part of my story. And it's so good to finally have a story's bump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do like that word. I think you're using it so much because of my reaction last time. <laughs> yeah, usually when you tell me I can't do something, it just makes me want to. Right. I didn't say you couldn't do Even it. Even more. I just said it's a funny way to describe it. <laughs> I think you said it wasn't appropriate or something like that. Yeah. But uh, sure. every, now that we're here... Where we've met, and you want me to, you know, in the last episode, I met you in Cairo's Cafe Gardendale, and you wanted me to come fax. (laughs) Or another way to say that is that I offered for you to use the fax machine in my dad's office. Girl, you know you wanted me to come fax. (laughs) But that that was in the last episode. It always brings me back to when we first started, this guy called me. I don't know how he got my cell phone number, but he called me and left a message, and he wanted to be on the podcast because he had a prison story. And he was an older guy. You know, I looked him up on Facebook. He was an older guy out in the country, like in North Alabama. I, te- I texted him. I didn't call him. I texted him. And he called back and left another voicemail and said, I'm just trying to wait on when is her story going to be part of your story. It don't make no <laughs> sense. And so hopefully he's still listening. I don't yeah. know his name, but hopefully he's still listening. Now he can see. He may have thought I was in prison. <laughs> I don't know. <Okay. laughs> anyway, cool. they have collided. The stories have... Bumped. Bumped. Uh, the, that's probably a good description in, like, in terms of we're not together yet. We yeah. literally, like, bumped into bumped each into other. Bumped into each other. I made yeah. bad. Yeah. Uh, where do we go from here? Okay. So this time frame that we're talking about is 2012 2012 okay we had a we experienced a lot of loss yes and i think it's important to tell that part just because it's kind of became part of our story yeah i mean it definitely for both of us ironically even though we didn't know each other weren't even friends so we weren't talking but we're Mm -hmm. um experiencing the same thing at the same time yeah Okay, so experiencing a lot of loss, what was that for you? For me, it was my granny. You want me to go first? Yeah, go ahead. My relationship with my granny was different than one you'd have with most grandparents. Um, tell us, tell me about that. My relationship with my granny was different. It, it's hard. It's hard to explain. Like my mama, my mom's mom, she passed away in two thousand and three, and that was the first real death that I experienced. Mm-hmm. I always had a weird. Uh, and how, how old were you when your Meemaw passed away? I was past 30. I think I was oh, okay. 31. Yeah, you were an adult. Yeah. I was, uh, uh, but growing up, I was always scared that people were going to die. And mm-hmm. I would see movies and somebody's mom would die or their grandparents. And I would always just, it, it was just my biggest fear. I think you have told me that before, that you were always afraid your mom or yeah. someone close to you was going to die. Yeah. And then I would come up with these weird scenarios. My Meemaw, who's my mom's mom, her husband died when he was 67. And it was right after I was born, so I had no memory of him. But I remember when she turned 67, I was about four or five. And I thought, well, meanwhile, 67, we got to get ready for her to die. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, I really thought that she's 67. You die when you're 67. Right. <laughs> and just being so sad. And then, of course, she lived another 30 years. <laughs> 30 this. years? Well, uh, she was almost, she was in her 90s. Wow. She was in her 90s when she passed away. Wow. But that was the first real, like, death that I experienced close to me. Uh, Both my grandfathers died when I was in prison. Mm -hmm. And my mom's dad, I felt relief when he died. Well, I can say that you said both of your grandfathers died when you were in prison. Did you feel kind of just removed from that situation because you couldn't go to the funeral or just the emotions? You were kind of... It was it was sad. My grandfather, my granddaddy, he died in uh, 1997. Mm Mm-hmm. And if you go back to the, I think that was season two. I was actually in lockup. Right, that right. Yeah. And it was just, it was, uh, it was sad, but it was difficult for me when my granddaddy passed away, just not being there, being with my family, being with my granny. We had never had like a close, close relationship. He was more of a, I loved him. I knew that he loved me. He was a provider, but he was, uh, he was not like. You weren't close. Yeah, we weren't. We didn't have yeah. a close connection. And then when my mom's dad died in 1998. 
he uh there was nothing I had nothing for him as far as feelings or emotions. Okay. But just you know, we can get in that another time. He was yeah. he was not a part of her life and he wasn't a good he wasn't a good father. I mean he's actually an abusive father. But then when my Meemaw passed away in two thousand and three, it was like I finally got it. Like when somebody dies Jesus can even help you through that. Like, there's peace. Like, I had this uh, incredible amount of peace, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like devastating. Yeah. And it was, it caught me off guard, and I didn't, because that was the thing that I dreaded all my life was somebody dying. Right. And then when it happened, it was like not so difficult. Well, I have to say too, when you're when someone's in their nineties, yeah, you kind of feel like, wow, that was a good long life. Yeah. You and, know? No, she was ready to go. She yeah. knew where she was going, and. Mm-hmm. She was uh, she was ready. Okay, so fast forward, your granny, so 2012, fast forward. what you were saying was your relationship with her was different, it was, and how was it different? My, my granny was my person. She was, uh, my granny and I had a special relationship, and I believe it was because my parents got married young. My mom had me when she was 18. My dad was 20, and he was in the Air Force and the military, and I was born in Tampa, Florida. And he was stationed at McDill Air Force Base. And my mom was just having a hard time taking care of me. (laughs) Like, she didn't know what to do. Yeah, because your mom was how old? She was 18. Yeah. But she was a kid herself. Right. She was the baby of her family, so she was kind of spoiled. She never learned how to, like, she didn't never even cooked a meal until after she was married. Right. And uh, apparently I had, I was colicky or something, they said. Yeah, that's just where you're upset stomach, something's bothering you, and they're very, babies are very fussy. Yeah. Yeah. But my dad told me later on, he said, every time you open your mouth, she would give you a bottle, and you were about to explode <laughs> many times. Like, he was trying to help her, and then they were arguing. But uh, he got finished with that when I was six months old, and they moved to Atlanta, Georgia, where my granny, my granddaddy, and all his side of the family were. And my grandparents had an apartment in their basement. It was like a full, you know, where somebody could live. And they were going to come there and live. So this is your dad's parents? Yeah. The Granny? Jo- the Joneses. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so y'all came to live in the basement of your grandparents' house. It was just, things were just different for us. My granny was there when I was born. Like, she was there with my mom. My dad had went home. She She's the one that nicknamed me JJ, <laughs> which stuck with me the rest of my life. But the story she tells, the way she tells it, and my mom always gets aggravated when she tells the story because, you know, she's my mama, was that they pulled up. I was six months old. They'd been driving, you know, 10, 12 hours. It was late. They, she opened the door. They came in, and my mama said, I can't stop him from crying. Take this baby. I can't take it anymore, and gave gave me to her. <laughs> yeah. Um, and my mom always says, that's not how that went down, and you know, but that's how my granny always told me that story. Right. And we lived there for the next two years, and she was my person. Like, she was the one that, like, took care of me, because they both had to work. My mom had to work. My dad had to work. And it was just always different with us. And then, you know, she had 15, 16 grandkids, but it was just more of a, it was just a different relationship. She was my... Almost more like a mother, not to say that to down my mama, but she just took on a role in my life that was different. She took on the mother role in a lot of areas, a lot of ways, I guess. Yeah, but not to say that my mom wasn't mothering me. Okay, so I think it's important because... I struggle with that. Okay, hold on. I think it's important for me to ask this because... People can't see your face right now, and I can see that you're struggling Uh hard, and I just, like, kind of want to talk about what... This feels very hard for you to talk about. So can you articulate what where the struggle is? I think I don't... In talking about this, it's making me miss my granny, and um, I don't want to be, like, some kind of way like disrespecting my mom. Yeah. Because my mom was my person too. You know, she raised right. me by herself. You know, my my grand my granny helped, my mom helped, but my dad was not really a big part of my life. And just I watched my mom struggle, especially after her second divorce. She would work twelve, eighteen hour shifts at a cotton mill to buy me shoes and so I don't know, I just don't wanna I want to say what I want to say about my granny and validate that, but at the same time, I don't want to disrespect my mom. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, and I think people need to hear that, and I think you need to say that, which you just did. Yeah. Um, Because 
I mean, anybody, I think, that we all have either known or are a single parent or single mom to yeah. know that struggle is so real and so hard, and especially when you're so young. Um, I mean, none of us really know what we're doing, but we especially <laughs> don't know what we're doing. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine having a baby at 18 and doing it on my own, you know, with. So I feel like there's just so much respect there and honor there. Yeah. Of who she is and what she did and what she did, what she had to do, mm-hmm. and um, but so talking about your granny doesn't take away from that. It doesn't. Yeah, and I just want to make sure I communicate that properly. Right. And then on the flip side, my mama, my mama's mama, she helped raise me too. Yeah. You know, they were all a big part. Of my grandmothers and my mom. Th- those were my people. Don't they say it takes a village? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't like that, though, because I think it takes two parents, a mom and a dad. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> if, but if you don't have that, I mean... Okay, I so what I hear you saying, and this is important because your memory is unbelievable compared to mine, and quite frankly, compared to most other people's, yeah. but from six months to two years old, you lived at your granny's house. Yeah. And she kind of, you know, your mom needed help, obviously, mm-hmm. and... According to your granny, was like I need help, <laughs> and your granny kind of like took over as any. I mean, grandmother. I feel like I read this thing one time that one of my friends had a baby, and it, the birth went all wrong, and he ended up being brain damaged. Anyway, I was struggling with what to say to her and how to talk to her, and I just didn't know what to say because I had had a baby around the same time. Yeah, that's sad. And I just felt like. And I read this article, and I do feel like the Lord, like, put it in my lap. And it was a similar situation with two friends. And the the friend that had the baby that had all the problems and challenges said, looked at your other friend and said, well, you're a mom, you know. And it was just like this light bulb went on. It's like, if if you're a mom, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Whether you have a healthy birth child or if you have because, or if you have a a child that has brain damage or because Mm -hmm. we're all moms and we all have the same emotion. And so... Your granny was a mom, so she knew, you know, like she knew. She was an old school mama, too. She was good. Yeah. Like she, she always said this, the only thing I ever knew how to do was raise babies, puppies, and cook. That's the only thing I know how to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Wait, no. raise babies? What was the second one? Raise babies, puppies, and raise puppies and cook. Oh. Like, she loved dogs. She was a dog lover. Yeah. Um, but uh, but because of that, what I was all that to say, those two years really, I feel like, established a bond. A connection, yeah. That was only built on as years went on, Mm -hmm. even though you weren't living there all the time. Yeah. But but that really, like, established the, like, okay. (laughs) It was, but then after that. She's like my other mom kind of thing. She was my person. Yeah. But it was, she she had a different kind of patience with me. Like, Mm -hmm. she was genuinely interested in me. She loved me. And she would do everything with me. And she would fuss at me. You know, she would discipline me. She only ever spanked me one time, and it wasn't a real spanking. It was just a slap on my leg, and it broke my heart. That My granny, <laughs> you hit me. Um, You're still crying over it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm no, okay. <laughs> not really. I, I probably needed more than that, but she had a way. She was just, you know, she pulled me in the kitchen. She's the one that gave me my love of cooking, and it's because I was a kid there with her, and she cooked all the time because mm-hmm. she was a three meal a day, you know, breakfast she took orders it was like <laughs> granny's house was like being at waffle house you know what you want you want waffles pancakes toast what, how you want your eggs cheese whatever you want french Hilarious. toast whatever you need and you know by that time she'd already raised six kids so she 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 had it going on she had it down <laughs> but she said that i was bad and i would get into stuff and i would uh i do remember getting in trouble because i used to like the plunder and stuff mm-hmm. like i would go in the bathroom and lock the door and go through like all the drawers and try to find stuff. <laughs> and she didn't like that. She didn't, she called it plundering. Yeah. But it's interesting to note now, you know, 40 years later, Lula May loves to plunder. Oh, she is a plunderer. <laughs> but I don't get on to her. I tell her, you have to be respectful <laughs> and I'll show you what you can plunder in. <laughs> and she loves it. Like, but it, I think we need to normalize the word plunder. Just going through, like, you know, I have, like, trunks that have my granny stuff, trunks that have your dad's stuff. We have uh, There's lots of boxes plunder. that have your mom's <laughs> stuff, your grandmother. You know, so just, we got plenty of stuff to go through. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I got my granny's recipes and you know, just stuff. Yeah. And she loves that. But I was like that when I was a kid. 
But she said she was always afraid I was going to fall and get hurt, so she would keep me in the kitchen with her. And when she was cooking, to keep me uh, occupied, she would give me something to do. So she said I might just roll some biscuits and just play with the dough, or, but I thought I was cooking. And by the time I was five or six, she was teaching me how to flip bacon. She was teaching me how to, uh, I think the first thing I ever cooked was breakfast, something for breakfast, an egg or something. And then, you know, microwaves came out during that time. I'm telling my age. Yeah. But I remember her <laughs> explaining, you can't put an egg in here. She was just, she taught me how to cook. She taught me how to wash clothes. She tried to teach me how to iron clothes, but I never had the patience for that. And when you were at Granny's, you were always doing something because she always had a project. Mm-hmm. She was always out in the yard working on something. And that was my life. You know, when I got to go to Granny's, it was just it was a good time. Yeah. And that was those were the highlights of my whole life. Mm-hmm. And I never lived with her. I lived with her shortly after mom's second divorce. I stayed with her for like six months. Yeah. And I wished I could have stayed there forever. After we moved to Phoenix City to Alabama, you know, she was in Atlanta. I feel like our relationship got even better because it was like, you know, I would spend weeks at a time in the summer and it was just, she taught me how to read books, mm-hmm. you know. And when I say books, like <laughs> a secret around our family was that Granny liked to read romance novels, but she would always say that she was reading history. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> but she did love history, but she would read the romance novels that were set in the wild, wild west or, you know, over in <laughs> Japan or during the war or something. But they were always had that overtone to them. But she actually helped me read my first book. Like, she instilled, like, a love of reading. Was it a history book? Mine was, yeah. I, I think <laughs> a real it, history book. Well, no, it was kind of, it was that V.C. Andrews stuff. It wasn't. What is that? It was an author back in the 80s that just. I had these dramas that they made up about families. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, all in all, she was my person. She taught me probably the most important thing was just how to be, how to love, and how to cook. <laughs> I know you're thankful for that. Absolutely. I would probably say, like, add to that just, you know, having coming into your life later in life, mm-hmm. just that she taught you by modeling just consistency and how to... Nurture someone. Yeah, she was a nurturer. She yeah. was a nurturer of everything. Like yeah. Food, family, yards. Right, puppies. yeah, exactly. <laughs> she did it all. And her probably her greatest joy was cooking for people. She mm-hmm. loved to cook for people, and she cooked for her family. But if there was a neighbor or a friend or anybody that was in need or somebody that needed encouragement, she was going to make them a pineapple upside-down cake and take it <laughs> to them. And just her... Lifelong love of cooking and food was what helped me later on get in the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. And most of the Cairo stuff came from her anyways. Yeah. Uh, You know, she taught me how to to get it done. Yeah. Okay, so where do we go from here? I guess just talk about, you know, after I got arrested, that was devastating for her. That was... uh, I can't imagine. It was hard. But Granny was different from my mom. Like, mom would just fall apart and, you know, uh, which is understandable. I'm not Right, yeah, for sure. But Granny would always try to find the silver lining in something. Like, in a lot of ways, the same way you are. Like, Mm -hmm. okay, we're here. This has happened. Let's figure out how to make this work. And she never did the, she wanted me home, but she never went through that thing where I felt like this pain all the time with her because it's like, this is what happened. This is what you did. Now we just got figured out and you'll be home soon. So, you know, she wrote me two or three letters a week. I wrote her, talked to her on the phone. She, uh, even when I didn't want her to, she would come make the 10-hour trip to see me in Brevard. And I'll tell her, I don't want you driving all that way, but somebody would come with her. But uh, she was my person. I can see how it's hard because, you know, when you said, like, your mom would fall apart, which was totally understandable, but your granny would not, would just be like, okay, what's the next thing? Because you were already feeling, like, all the guilt and all the weight. Yeah. And all, I mean, I just know how I feel when I do something that's affected someone else that I love, and then mm-hmm. I feel terrible about it. And I don't need it, usually any extra because I already feel as as low <laughs> as it, it can go. You know what I mean? Yeah, you don't need any added <laughs> So <weight. laughs> Right. So it's just kind of like, even if I'm not saying it, I'm feeling it. And I f- yeah. think you're similar in that way. Mm-hmm. So that response is... Very helpful life, because you do already feel very life horrible. Yeah, very life giving. That was a 
having her on my side during that time, it was hard, but it wasn't uh, wasn't as painful as some other stuff. So, what was her response when you got out? Oh, in 1999 when I got to prison? Yeah. Do you remember that, like, specifically? Like, was it, you, did you tell her the phone, or how did that? Oh, yeah. That was her greatest, me. like, joy. You know, she walked, you know, through the process of, you know, I'm going for parole, this might happen, you know, pray, all things. I think initially her only aggravation was the first month that I was out of prison, I couldn't go see her. Mm. So she had to come see me. and she Because was, it was a different state? Yeah. I had to, I had to put in my parole time. Okay. I forget what it was, but it was two or three months before you could get a, a pass to go out of state. Mm-hmm. But once I got to that place, you know, I, I did that all the time. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I say that was her greatest joy was because going forward, she was going to put herself in her little Toyota Camry and drive over to Birmingham on the regular. <laughs> you know, <laughs> she was always here with me. My first apartment, you know, she came and was like, Baby, you ain't got no curtains. And I said, Granny, I don't need curtains. I'm just a man. I'm, no, 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 you got to have curtains. So, you know, I go to the store. I think she actually made those curtains while she was there that weekend. But then just the little touches and stuff, she would help me organize and, you know, show me how to, you know, this is how you fold towels. <laughs> she had a she had a system for everything around the house. Mm-hmm. And she taught it to me. And to this day, I can still hear her voice like, you know, make sure you clean the baseboards because if you don't, you're nasty. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Or, you know, like the toilet, you clean it daily. You don't have to wait. Cleanliness in the kitchen, how to cook, how to keep things organized, and, you know, how to shop for groceries and stuff like that. But then when I bought my first house, she was so just wanted to be such part of that process. But I was asking her because I needed her advice. And her advice was always that you don't buy cheap furniture. Like if you're going to buy a, a couch, Go ahead, save your money, buy a good couch, because then you won't have to buy it again. Right. And that was her, you know, we still have furniture that belonged to my granny, because mm-hmm. that was her philosophy. And it was kind of funny, because, you know, if you contrast that with my mom's side of the family, they bought a new couch and living room set every time they got their taxes, <laughs> which was like once a year. But it was because they would go buy it at the handy furniture mart, and it just didn't last. But just those things... um, Oh, I'm talking about all that furniture, but it just, there's so much that I can look at my life today and just see her fingerprint on it. Yeah. In the things that I do, the way I think, the way I make decisions. And there was nobody like her. Mm-hmm. That's my granny. Yeah. <laughs> she basically weighed in on everything in my life relationships, you know, with Shauna. She approved of her, she liked her, she saw that she made me happy. But then after she cheated on me that one time, (laughs) and then we tried to get back together later on, Granny was like, you don't get back together with somebody that hurt you or cheated on you. So, Especially if you're not even married yet. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. But, you know, she had her own past. She had stuff that she went through. So did you have anything that you, like, argued over or didn't agree (laughs) on? We had Granny and I were very much like she cared about the things I cared about. I learned to care about the things that she was cared about, but we did have a few friction points. Um, probably the biggest one was during the 2000 election when George Bush was running against Al Gore to be president. Okay. <laughs> she she didn't like George Bush because she would say, I've always been a Democrat, I'm a lifelong Democrat, and I'm just going to be a Democrat, and I can't stand George Bush. And I like George Bush. I thought he was... You know, he's real, he was authentic, he had his flaws and all that stuff, but that's who I was rooting for, even though I don't consider myself a Republican or Democrat, never have. But she was a party voter, obviously. Oh, yeah, she was, uh, but I was like, Granny, how could you be for Al Gore? He's not even there. Like, he's not even, (laughs) he's not even a person, he's just like a a robot. But uh, it it never got where it was, went too far, it was just, Mm -hmm. you know, we'd have a little banter and stuff like that. And then, I know, and I believe this was genuine, when Obama was elected in 2008, she, like, that was just a big deal to her, like, you know, that African-American could get... Like a good big deal? Oh, yeah. Okay. Like, she, was, uh, she was all about that. Yeah. It was neat to me seeing somebody of her age being so excited about our first African-American president because just knowing, you know, how generational stuff, like, with... Just how people are, but right. she didn't. She never picked up on any of that. She didn't. Uh, I think she saw herself early in her life as kind of an outsider, so she identified with all people. Like she uh-huh. didn't have a problem 
it didn't matter about, you know, race or any of that stuff to her. And I appreciate that she taught me that too. Like right. you, you love people. But uh the other friction that we had that would be ongoing was when I had my come to Jesus in nineteen ninety six. Your literal come to Jesus? Yeah, after I had a experience with Jesus and yeah. started following him. She uh she didn't really she didn't like it. That's interesting. Well, I mean, she didn't like say I didn't I don't like this, but you could tell it was uh it just became a some contentious with us. Why? Well, number one, I was probably overdoing it because you know how it is when you first have that experience, you want to tell everybody. And for me, I wanted everybody to have the same experience that I had, and I knew that they could, but that they were going about it in like a religious kind of way, and that that I've discovered the truth. Like Jesus is not a religion. There's a religion about Jesus. But that's not who he is, and that's not how he works. Yeah. And I would get so excited and want to talk to her, and I think I, I overdid it, you know, mm-hmm. long long story short. and Just trying to convince her or talking about it too much? Or? Oh, yeah. Because okay. as far as communication from when I was locked up, she was the only one that got two or three letters from me a week. And, oh, okay. and you know, in letters, you can really... I mean, I had other family members that I wrote, but she was my... Nobody's talking back. You can just go on and on and on. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I I think I overdid a little bit, and then she had that kind of mindset, like my mom, like, JJ's in God in prison and just lost his mind. (laughs) Yeah. Joined a cult or something like that. And it was uh, hard for me to try to explain that to her. But when I got out of prison... Mm -hmm. When she came to see me, she would go to church with me. You know, she would say all the things. She would say all the right things. But I knew that Granny had never had a connection with Jesus, and is that just something you felt? No, or you sensed, or how did you know that? <laughs> we all kind of talked about that mm-hmm. because Granny would always be a member of a church. Like when I was growing up, she lived in Clif- the Cliftondale community. She was a member of the Cliftondale Baptist Church. Mm-hmm. That was her church. She'd tell you that. But she never went to church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't pray, you know, instead of, uh, unless it was like, you know, Lord have mercy. Or, you know, like if we were getting on her nerves. Right. She might say that. Or if she prayed, I didn't know about it. Yeah. Um, she did teach me things out of the Bible. She sent Glennis to a Christian school, kind of like your mom did with you. So it was like she had all the values, all the, I guess, like the, what am I trying to say, like all the trappings of Christianity? All the check marks. Yeah. <laughs> well, which I feel like in her defense, I mean, that's pretty typical in this in the, in the Bible Belt and, yeah, in the South. It is, but you go to church and at least act like you're doing. Some Granny people never don't, ch- yeah. Gran- Granny didn't go to church. <laughs> yeah. Easter, we had Easter, but we didn't go to church. Right. You know? Not even on Easter? No. We, wow. I never, I can't ever think of Or Christmas? Nope. Wow. We did okay. our family stuff. It was none of that. So I knew that, that that piece was missing for her. And it yeah. would become clear, more evident to me, I guess, later on. But that was who she was. And at the same time, there's something I always loved about that with her was Granny was going to be who she was. And if you didn't like it, you know, she wouldn't be disrespectful, but you were not going to make her be something that she wasn't. Mm-hmm. Like my dad got in this thing where he's doing vitamins all the time. <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it, but he would take like 74 vitamins a day and he started studying vitamins and he brought her over a probably $500 bag worth of vitamins and laid them all out and told her, you know, you got to take magnesium and this and that. And I said, Daddy, she's not going to take that. And he was like, yes, she will, especially, you know, I invested all this money in it. I said, she'll smile at you and say yes, but she ain't going to be doing all that. Yeah. <laughs> and I was right. She never, she was like, bless his heart, you know. <laughs> He's trying to help, but, you know, I am not be doing all that. So there's something to be appreciated about the fact that she was she was going to be herself. and But that made her real. Like, her love was real. Her affection was real. Her interest was real. Mm-hmm. And I just don't know how much more I can say about that. Yeah. She was just very much, even though she was older, you know, I'm going to have my house. I'm going to have my car. <laughs> I'm going to be me. You be you. You know. I have concern, do whatever you want to, but I'll make the final decision on everything to do with me. And I respect that. I mean, I feel like I'm very similar to that. Yeah, your mom was My like mom that. was like she, that. Too. I remember yeah. when your mom, the last year of her life, one time she told somebody, Hobie, come on, your brother, he is not in charge. I'm in charge of me, okay? Just to let everybody know. 
But I, I, I understand that because I think I'm probably going to be the same way. Yeah. But she trusted us. She loved us. But she was going to make the final call. And then there were just so many during those years after being out of prison, she would spend two or three weeks with me at a time. I would always go over there and spend, I didn't spend weeks, but I, I would, you know, make an effort at least every couple of months to go spend a couple of days. Um, but she was always welcome to come to my house. Sometimes she would come and stay a week and, you know, I would go to work and she would just hang out and decorate or, you know, do whatever. Um, she always had to have a project, work in the yard. That was her thing. The spiritual part of her that, you know, that she I knew she didn't have a connection with Jesus. I would even do like sneaky stuff to try to like get her attention. Like if we were watching TV, like if we were at her house or at my house and we were watching TV, I would try to like slip uh, Joe Osteen <laughs> in, mm-hmm. well, you know, because he's always smiling, happy. He's not religious. I mean, yeah. he's telling you about <laughs> Jesus, and he gets criticized. But like somebody that needs it, like a fresh wind, like right. But she would see that he was preaching, and she would say, "Turn that off. I'm not watching that mess." <laughs> and so, anything I ever tried with her like that, it didn't work. Yeah. And I just I prayed for, her and I felt like I knew she was too smart. Oh yeah, <laughs> Granny didn't play. But in 2010, we had, I guess it was kind of a crisis with her. She was very independent. She was going to live by herself, do her own thing. But she was also in her 80s. So I also was going to ask how old she was at that point. Well, we had recently stopped her from driving. because It just got to the place where, Granny, you can't see. You have a wreck. You know, you don't want to die in a car. Yeah. <laughs> and we would get her and take her places and do all things. But she had a tree that fell in her house and poked a hole in the seat on in the roof. Mm-hmm. And we didn't know this, but she had canceled her homeowner's insurance, so she didn't have coverage. Oh. And but she was too proud to tell us. And she had a neighbor come and put a tarp over on the roof. And it was like it was a very cold winter. It was, it was January, February, I believe it was 2010 mm-hmm. when Glenn's called me, and she had been like her house was cold and dripping. <laughs> yeah, and so it just became apparent, you, Granny, you can't live by yourself anymore. Right, and that was just devastating for her. But she got to a place where she accepted it. She ended up going to live with my aunt Glennis, who was her youngest daughter. But I always said, when Granny has to live with somebody, she's either going to live with Glennis or she's going to live with me, just because we understood her and were, not that we were closer to her, but just like in our home, she could be herself. She didn't have to like right. put on or however you want to say it. But she went to live with Glennis, and at that time, I was doing the Kairos thing where I was starting a second restaurant. Yeah, that was about the same time you were starting the Gardendale restaurant, right? It was the exact same time. Wow. And I was also living in an apartment with my mom. So it was like, I could have made something happen. I could have worked it out. I could have figured it out, but she wanted to go stay with Glenn, so that was what we did. But uh, immediately the friction started after she moved in with Glennis because Granny was used to being the woman of the house. She right. was used to being, you know, I do all the meals, I do all the laundry, do all the things. But then you contrast her with my Aunt Glennis, who is more like my granddaddy, who is, a, you know, she's an eight on the Enneagram, a challenger. Mm-hmm. Like, she just, nobody was going to come in Glennis' house and take over. I right. And, well, that's a hard dynamic, I feel like, oh, yeah. no matter what the personality type is. Mm-hmm. Because when my grandmother came in to live with my mom and dad, that was a very difficult transition. Hey, well, I've never heard for you say everybody. That. Yeah, it was so so hard on my mom, on my dad. Yeah, and my neither my mom or my grandmother were like challengers or anything like that. But it was still very difficult. Well, it was like that. But you know, Glennis was going to do what she had to do for Granny. Figured out. But she had two kids to at home, a stepson, a husband, and a full life. You know, they worked mm-hmm. full time. They were in sports. They just had something going on all the time. So Granny started, I guess, like feeling sorry for herself. Like, you know, they, I'm here. <laughs> I have to interject here because I really do feel like having walked through this with my grandmother and mm-hmm. then as well as my mom, who wasn't old, but we walked through a sickness with her and yeah. seeing Older people, whether they're that not that much older or way older in Granny's case. Yeah. But, like, to lose your independence as an adult. It's hard. I think that a lot of people our age who mm-hmm. have not seen a parent or a grandparent 
walk them through that. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just, I have so much empathy, I think, of myself, like, losing my independence after a lifetime yeah. <laughs> of being independent and then someone coming and telling me you can't. It's or hard. you won't, or you can't live by your. It is. It's humbling and it's just hard. I just feel for. Oh, I, I did too. Her. Well, no, <laughs> during know? that time, I took on more of a role of you know I'll come over as much as I can, but you know I've, I've got a f- full time business that I'm yeah. running, and I promised her a minimum once a month. You know, I'll try to do more, mm-hmm. and she would still come stay with me. But she got in a funk where she was depressed, like. Just feeling sorry for herself. Mm-hmm. And it was basically because she wasn't in charge of her home and her life. And we came up with this idea. I don't remember if it was me or Glennis that came up with the idea, but this assisted living idea of these assisted living places, not nursing homes. Mm-hmm. And it just so happened that I had a friend, Wally, who I went to church with. He was an older man. But he had some health problems, and he went into this assisted living place, and he loved it. Like, I mean, he came to church every Sunday yeah. talking about it. They so, give you a lot of your independence back, but still you, there's you, someone and people kind of overseeing. Yeah. Yeah. So Granny was coming to stay with me for a week, and I just pulled up on him, and I said, this would be perfect for my Granny. You know, just where she's at. She's living with my aunt. She's not happy. You know, by this time, now my aunt and Clintus and their family are starting to get resentful. This would be perfect for her. Like, give me some advice. Like, how could I get her Mm -hmm. to want to even consider that as an option? Yeah. And he said, don't talk to her about it. Just bring her out. Let's have lunch and let her see for herself. And so I thought, well, that's a wonderful idea. So Granny, I told her, I think it was on Saturday or something. I was like, we're going to go have lunch with my friend Wally. You remember Wally? Oh, I remember him. He's a sweet man. So we go out there somewhere on the outskirts of Birmingham, I don't remember where it was. It was out I-20, mm-hmm. far. And it was a beautiful setting. You know, it had a lake and ducks, and it was it was nice. But when we went in, he, Wally immediately, like, took charge and was, like, showing her everything. And I could see her mind start working. <laughs> she was bristling. That's what I call. And when we sat down and ate lunch, and this was a nice place, but it did have a little bit of a nursing home feel to it. When we sat down to eat, to eat lunch, she leaned over to me. She said, I know what you're doing. Don't even try me with this. I'm not doing this. I know I know what you're That's doing. That's great. <laughs> I'm not coming here, so don't, yeah. even, don't even ask. And so when we left there, I didn't. I called Glennis, and I said, "This, I thought this would be great, but mm-hmm. no, it's not. <laughs> yeah. So Glennis was looking into other places, but these— some of these assisted living places, especially in Atlanta when they were nice, they were, like, uber expensive. And Glennis is resourceful, and she's kind of like you, you know, figured out and dig and dig and ask all the questions. And she found out that Granny had some kind of benefit because my grandfather was a retired military. Mm-hmm. And long story short, she found a place outside of Atlanta in Dallas, Georgia, which would put Granny in between Denise and her, so they could both take care of her equal, you know, distance. But then it would put her closer to the Alabama line so that I would only be an hour to, okay. to drive, you know. It was like an hour plus like three minutes. It was nothing yeah. to make the trip over there. But then it was trying to get Granny to want to go there. <laughs> so we set it up. I came over for the weekend, and we told Granny we just want to show her this place. Mm-hmm. And... Glennis and her husband and kids, they were in one car. Granny got in the car with me, and she complained, like, the whole way there. Like, what are y'all trying to do? And I'm like, Granny, we're not trying to do anything. You're not happy where you're at, and we got to do something different. So we just want to look at our options, but nobody's going to make you do anything you want to do. So I'm following Glennis through Atlanta and all stuff, but Glennis is an Atlanta driver, so she's like a crazy person when she's driving. (laughs) Like she's jumping over, turning. Like I can't, fo- I can't follow you. Like so, I had to put it in my GPS. And when we got there, I don't know if I put the wrong address or what happened, but it took me down a hill into some woods with like a cul-de-sac, like a dead end, and it was mm-hmm. just woods. And Granny panicked and like grabbed me. What are y'all trying to do to me? Like freaked out. And I was like, Granny, we love you. Nobody's trying to do anything with you. But anyways, we made our way to the place, and when we pulled up in there, it looked like a hotel. It was like four or five stories, 
um, beautiful landscape and all things. And she didn't, she wouldn't get out when we got there. But I pulled up and, you know, I'm reasoning with her, talking with her, you know, just need you to look. Don't need you to make any, just look. We got in there, it didn't take 10 minutes of them showing her, like, the, the, Amenities. Yeah. No, it was crazy. This place was yeah. crazy. I, I actually leaned over. I said, Granny, I don't feel so bad about getting old if I know something like this is waiting <laughs> on me. I think it took her 10 or 15 minutes, and she was like, well, where do I sign? <laughs> so she was ready to do that, and it was a, a great joy for us to be able to move her into there because it wasn't a nursing home type of place. It was they all had apartments. She, yeah. She, there were small apartments, but it was like a living room. Living room, bedroom, bathroom, like a kitchenette. So it didn't, they couldn't cook in there, but there was like a microwave, sink, dishwasher, refrigerator, mm-hmm. all the things. And she loved it. And we got her set up, got her moved in. You know, she got to keep her favorite furniture that she wanted and stuff like that. And for a season, it was, um, it was good because this place, I could even go spend the night with her. Like there was a blow up mattress or whatever. And, you know, I did that several times. Other people in my family did. And for about a year, she just spent her time enjoying that because she was around other people her age. They were always doing things like they cooked for. (laughs) She called me one time and said, these nurses came around and knocked on my door and asked me if they could cut my toenails. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, what? And she said, yeah, they have a service where they come around and cut your toenails. And I said, would you get your, did you get your pedicure? And she was like, I'm not just to let somebody cut my toenails. But that part of it was beautiful because, you know, you get to the end of your life. We got to the end of Granny's life, and she got to enjoy that. Right. And she really loved it. But I started getting, like, this burden of being scared, for her spiritual condition, because I felt like I knew that she had never, like, made a connection with Jesus. Was this, at, like, how long after that she moved in that you started feeling this burden? Probably six months a year. Okay. I mean, it was very, I don't believe in all the hellfire and brimstone and, you know, you're going to go to hell if you don't say it right and all that stuff. I do believe heaven and hell are real, mm-hmm. but, you know, we don't really know what happens when yeah. we die. But I do know this, because it's clear in the Scripture, that if you belong to Jesus— that wherever he is, that's where you're going to be. Mm-hmm. So I put all my stock in that. And I know Jesus, so I know when my time is up, I'm going to be with him. Right. And he's in heaven, so mm-hmm. that's where I'm going to be. But I, I didn't have that, what am I trying to say? Um, I didn't have that knowing with my granny. Mm-hmm. Kind of like you had with your mom. You knew. I didn't have that with my granny, and it scared me. And like it became, it began to come up. It be, I'm trying to say, it began to become a thing where it was almost daily like this nagging. Mm -hmm. And all I needed to do for her was to pray for her. Because by this time, I had been talking to her about this stuff for, you know, going on 20 years. Mm -hmm. And whatever I was trying to say to her, she wouldn't hear me. (laughs) So I went to Steve and I said, I need some help. I'm worried about my granny. And he said, well, the problem with you, James, is you're always trying to get her saved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that's not even, I know that's something we do in the South, but that's not even biblical. Because just because somebody, you aggravate somebody enough to say a sinner's prayer on a card does not mean that they've had an experience with Jesus. So did he have any other advice for you? <sighs> well, he said, and this was probably some of the best advice I've ever been given in my life. He said, uh, God only works in our lives when we invite him to do so because he won't violate our free will. And I believe that. Mm-hmm. And he said, so instead of doing all the things that you've been doing with her that don't work, why not you just say, Granny, can I sincerely pray for you and ask her to give you permission to allow Jesus to work in her life? And I thought, well, okay, that's what I'll do. So I was over there for the weekend. We spent the day. We got to the end. We were ready to go. I said, Granny, I need to talk to you. I need to have a serious talk. She was like, okay, baby. And I, she was in a recliner. I got down on my knees next to her. And I said, I want to pray for you. And I need your permission to ask Jesus to give you his presence in your life. And she kind of looked at me funny. And she said, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but you could tell she was a little like, what's he doing? What's he doing? 
what's he doing to me? Well, it's funny because, I mean, I think from her standpoint, I wasn't there. I didn't know her, obviously. But, like, you can tell when someone you know and that you really love is, like, being serious and really is, like, wanting to get your attention about something. Even, that I had an agenda. Even if you don't fully understand what or yeah. why, but you kind of want to, like, okay, I can give that to you because I love you, you know? <laughs> but she trusted me. Yeah. And she knew that I loved her and everything. Mm-hmm. And so I said, I just need you to tell me. Give me your permission to ask Jesus to bring his presence into your life and show you who he is. And she was like, okay. Okay. (laughs) But when I started praying for her, this is one of the most beautiful spiritual moments of my life. When I started praying for her, I immediately sensed that the wall that she had up was not like unbelief or, you know, whatever. It was a wall that came from church hurt. Like, she had been wounded and hurt by people in the church that are mm. supposed to represent Jesus. And I had never thought that before. Never That had never crossed my mind. But, you know, when Jesus is telling you what to do, he shows you stuff. What do you think? That, did you, like, sense what the hurt, like, the root of it? Like, oh, when, I, she, when she got hurt? Oh, I immediately knew what it was. Okay. Let me get to this, and I'll say what it okay. was. Okay. So I stopped praying, and I looked at her. And I said, Granny, Jesus is not church people. And honestly, I hate most church people. And if you think that I would follow the Jesus that they talk about, you don't know. Because I wouldn't. And she, it was like I could see understanding behind her eyes like she really understood. And I was like... You connected to something that she was feeling, Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But for her, it was like almost 80 years old. <laughs> right. Thing. And she heard me. She let me pray for her, and she said, thank you, and all the things. And I left, but, like, she didn't say no sinner's prayer, do no stuff. (laughs) (laughs) But I've always believed it. That's not always where it is because it wasn't like that for me. I had an experience with Jesus, and then I went to church three days later and asked them. They said, oh, you got to say the prayer and do the confession. And then they wet me with water and all things. And I was like, well, that's great, but I didn't already— I connected with Jesus back right. there. So I was trying to get her to that place. But the thing, the backstory to that with Granny was that she comes from a small town. Well, she came from Phoenix City. She grew up right outside of Phoenix City. Small town. They went to the local Baptist church, and she got married when she was, I think she was 14 years old when she got married. Golly, was she pregnant before she was married? I don't know. That's we the think, only reason I can think of getting married at 14. <laughs> we think that's possible. Okay. We, we don't know. She never told us for sure. Okay. But it was not uncommon in those days. This was like in the 19 teens. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's what they did. Yeah. Especially in the country. But she got married young, had a baby, and she came home from work or somewhere. She came home one day and found her husband in bed with another woman and lost her mind. Like, that's the unforgivable. Like, she couldn't be married to him after that. So she did the, the no-no in those days was she got a divorce, and he ran off. So here she is, single mother with a baby, and she had to humble herself and move back home to her parents. And my nanny was very faithful to the Baptist church, and, you know, whatever the teachings was, was that if you ever get married and get a divorce— you're kind, you kind of got a scarlet letter on you after that, but you definitely don't ever get remarried. So that mm-hmm. wasn't a thing. And her mama told her, you don't, you can't get remarried. And when Granny gave pushback on that, you know, I'm not even, this is not my fault. I didn't, this was done to me. She was still a teenager, literally, probably. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Nanny told her. Granny Which is t- her mother. Yeah. Granny yeah. told me this later on. Nanny told her, what is wrong with you, girl? You think you're going to get to heaven one day and be up there with Jesus and all the saints and the angels, and there's going to be two men that you've slept with? Well, what what would we do then? <laughs> but uh, Granny and her, you know, she's going to be, she's going to do her thing. She met my grandfather. Through it four- goes back to what you were saying about <laughs> she's going to do what she's going to do and like. Well, she rebelled against that. Right. Like, I'm. I'm a teenager. You tell me I can't never be married and have a family? Like, I got to be a single mother the rest of my life? But uh, she met my grandfather when she was working a cotton mill in Columbus, Georgia. She saw James C. Jones, and she was like, ooh, I got to have me some of that good stuff. <laughs> it's kind of like you and your facts. Uh, 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 
Anyway, we'll <laughs> circle back to that later, but yes. But they got married, and Nanny and Papa didn't want her to marry him. But if they hadn't, if she hadn't married Granddaddy, I wouldn't be sitting here right now talking to you. Mm-hmm. So religion is mean. It just is. So all that to say, that was the that was the hurt that came from a church belief, religion, whatever. She was that all, her mom was a part of back in the early nineteen hundreds. She was always an outsider after that, right? To the things of God, to religion, to church, and all things. Yeah, and it made sense now. Like, while she had, like, values, she did all things, but she wouldn't go to church. She wouldn't right. watch preaching. She didn't pray. She didn't do none of that. And it's just crazy to think about. It. Something like that, that kind of a wall, that kind of a hurt could be carried throughout decades and decades of your life. It makes sense to me. I think, you know, I mean, we could take this conversation in a, a dozen different directions, but... In the way that if you're a young woman, I mean a teenager, you're like let's think about that. Your brain is not fully developed. Yes, yeah, you imagine. have a baby and you have a husband, and you come home and your husband is in bed with another woman. I don't care what time period we're talking about. I don't, yeah. that feels like the deepest cut, the deepest portrayal. Yeah, and then to know that someone's not gonna. And then you take a move to say, that's not for me. I'm not doing that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to, and to feel like you don't have any support. Like, and you're almost like condemned for doing that yeah. when you're the one that was hurt. Because of, I the, mean, it all feels very, which, because to of a me religious gives doctrine. Me, yeah, mad respect, honestly, for your granny because it's just like that kind of stuff, quite frankly, I mean, the same stuff's happening today. They're yeah. using a little better words, more accepting words. But Absolutely. But the same stuff is happening today. And she's like, that's, you know, that's not okay. And I'm not going to stand for that. I love that, actually. I'm like, <laughs> yes, girl, yes. <laughs> but anyways, long story short, Granny married Granddaddy. She married my Granddaddy. He joined the Army, which became, when the Air Force opened up, he switched over to the Air Force. Yeah. And they lived the rest of their life traveling the world. You know, they mm-hmm. were in Okinawa. My Aunt Denise was born there. My aunt Glennis was born in in Germany. You know, they had my dad, then they had um, my uncle Ricky and my uncle Ronnie. So they had six kids total, and they lived a beautiful life. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they had their problems. We've talked about some of that. But um, fast forward to 2011, I was worried about her. And after that time, when I said the prayer for her and did all things that Steve told me to do. Thanksgiving was coming up, and we set up. Um, I just contacted everybody. So I feel like this is Granny's last Thanksgiving, and we need to make an effort to all be together and be with her. You have told me before that you like just had a very strong knowing that that was going to be her last Thanksgiving. I did, and I didn't like it, and I didn't want it to be. Right. But it was. Uh, I just felt like we got to do something. Because mm-hmm. by that time, we didn't all get together for holidays. Right. There were too many of us. Like, you would have had to rent out a football stadium to have everybody together. Mm-hmm. But my cousin, Beth, her husband runs a, a school over in Douglasville, Georgia. And he let us meet in their cafeteria slash gym, whatever. But it was a beautiful time. We invited, you know, not just immediate family, like her extended family, like her niece, Wanda Jean from Phoenix City came with her son Heath and his daughter, and it was a great day, but Granny that day was worse than she had ever been. Like, she was uh, wanting to be rolled around in a wheelchair. Like, physically worse? or Physically, many of the most. Like, there was no pleasing her. She oh, okay. was Just hard to be with. It was sad. Yeah. It was just sad. And I remember thinking that day, like, why? Why did I listen to Steve take his advice? Like, I, <laughs> before we did this prayer, like, she was one way. Now she's worse. I don't even mm-hmm. understand what's happening. But uh, we got through that, and the end of December 2011, I went to spend the day with her. And I was actually dreading it because I was going to have to tell her that Karina and I were engaged. <laughs> <laughs> and she had met Karina. Uh oh. And she wasn't about that. <laughs> she wasn't about the Karina life. No, she didn't like her. Actually, she told me, no. <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking. I know you're lonely. I know the other girl <laughs> broke your heart, but you need to figure out something else because that's not it. But uh, 
I didn't want to like keep that from her. I was going to tell her, but I wanted to tell her in person. So this was after Thanksgiving. Yeah, it was thing. okay. So how long after? Like a month or a couple months? Or? It was around Christmas, okay. 2011. Okay. But when I got there to pick her up, I was shocked. Like everything was different about Granny because I was late. Mm-hmm. And with Granny, you didn't be late. <laughs> you'd be on time, or you'd you didn't be, early. be late. <laughs> no, she would fuss at you about yeah. it. Yeah, especially in her old age because it was like she had this like chip on her shoulder like people don't care about me well it's probably she was just looking so forward to it no she was yeah but i felt like out of all the kids and grandkids i spent more time doing the things right so i didn't feel i didn't have any guilt any regrets anything (laughs) because i did no but i felt like she put so much into my life it was automatic for me to put back into her life but when i got there i was late and i was like braced for the you know the the guilt and all the things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she was just so pleasant. Like, oh, it's okay, baby. And she would always have a list of places that she wanted to go because she was in a new city. Even though it was in the Atlanta area, this was Dallas, Georgia. A new suburb, more yeah. or less, yeah. But, I mean, it was pretty far out from Atlanta, so we didn't know in this area. Yeah. But we would just go explore and find places. And by the time, there was GPS. So I was... Kind of shocked by that, that she wasn't fussing at me for being late. And then I pulled her wheelchair out to put her in it, to roll her out to my car. And she's like, oh, I'm not taking that. I'm done with that. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and by this time, she had been two or three months in having to be wheeled around in a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. So I reached in the closet and I pulled her walker out. And she said, no, I'm not going to need that either. I'm just going to hold on to your arm. So I was like, oh, what's, <laughs> what's happening here? I always respected her wishes. I mean, I did have in the back of my mind, maybe we should take this in case I need it. Right. I get you off somewhere in Walmart or wherever you want to go. But that day, I won't say it was the best day ever happened with my granny, but it was a different kind of day Mm -hmm. because she was so pleasant, so full of life. Something that was like, did they do something with her medication? Like, it's something, something weird going on with granny. There was a definite shift. Yes. And even in the restaurant. Like, she liked to be picky to the servers and about her food and stuff like that. She wasn't even like that when we went and ate lunch. And I was like, what is happening here? So we got back. I got her settled in, got all her stuff unpacked, all the things. And I needed to tell her about Karina. But I was, like, dreading it. Especially, you're like, man, it's been such a good day. (laughs) It was a good day. (laughs) But when I told her, she just kind of turned her head up and looked up. And she said... You know what, baby? I know that you hear from God, and He's going to show you what to do. And if you're supposed to be married to her, you will be, and it'll be beautiful. But if you ain't, you won't. (laughs) (laughs) And I was just like, what has happened to my granny? Like, nothing is pissing her off. There's nothing, (laughs) nothing is taking her off the center. And I said, well, I appreciate that, you know, all things. And I was getting ready to leave, and I was literally walking out the door, and she said, J.J., I need to tell you something. And I said, what is it? And she said, I just want you to know, we have a church in here, and I've been going to church, and I've been asking Jesus to give me his presence, and I've been asking for prayers, and I've been praying, (laughs) and he has. So she was basically telling me that she had an experience Mm-hmm. With Jesus. And I was so just like flabbergasted. Like, I didn't even know what to say back, but it was so real and it wasn't religious. It wasn't, you know, I got the King James and not, you know, it was sweet and beautiful and so sincere. And there was evidence of it. Just my day that I spent with her. Right. And she said, I just, I just felt like I, I want you to know. And, I did. (laughs) And that, as far as like, I feel like that was like, I think she was 88 at that time. Granny's in heaven. (laughs) No, but I mean that she had an experience with Jesus at 88 years old after everything she had been through in her life. And then, Mm. you know, I went back home. It wasn't two weeks later. I broke up with Karina. (laughs) I called her and was like trying to explain all that. And she was like, oh, I know. <laughs> I already know. Like she took personal credit for it. <laughs> she took personal responsibility for the fact that I didn't marry Karina. 
<laughs> and she said, I went to the pastor and I asked for prayers. And I told him, my grandson hears from God, but he's obviously, <laughs> this little girl put something on him that he can't He has a little wax off. in his ears and needs to be cleaned out. <laughs> but uh, she needed a professional Christian to handle this a little bit, so she went to the pastor. But uh, I was like, well, yeah, well, I appreciate it, you know. But she did, she took personal responsibility for that. But she was like a a little kid after mm-hmm. that. Because this, I forget the name of it, it was like Creekside Pines or something, but they had a Facebook page that I followed. And she would be on her Facebook page, like, bopping around there in her little scooter and doing all the activities and stuff. <laughs> and she was just so full of life and enjoying life, and I'd never seen her like that. Mm-hmm. And then in March of 2012, like, I got the call from my Aunt Denise, like, mom's in the hospital, and I was in the throes of opening. So is this just a couple months after this? Yeah. Wow. It okay. was definitely like. This day that was so awesome and when she told you. Yeah, it, was it was just a couple months after that. It was the end of her life. Like, yeah, literally the end of her life. Very yeah. end. But I never never would have thought it would have been that soon or that sudden. Even though I was prepared. And then after that, I felt like I had peace and I wasn't worried about her anymore. Mm-hmm. But when Denise called me and told me mom's in the hospital, I was like, for what? And it was, they couldn't even tell me what it was. It was like, her sodium's off and this, that, and it didn't, like nothing made any sense. And I was like, well, I don't want, this was like the fourth or fifth time that we'd had the alarm bell where we all gathered. Mm -hmm. And then she always pulled through. And I wasn't taking it like too serious because it was like they couldn't tell me anything. They couldn't Mm -hmm. tell me anything like definite. Right. So I didn't rush over there. But then about, I guess it was about a week later, Denise called me and said, Mom's asking for you. You need to get over here. And so I was like, okay, I'm I'm on my way. And then my dad called, and apparently the doctors had said something. And he was like, are you going over? And I said, I'm going over. He said, can I ride? Can we ride together? And I said, yeah, we can ride together. So we rode over. And when we got there, it was the end, but I didn't, I guess I never would have thought it was the end. So you just said you read over with your dad and it was the end, but you didn't realize it was the end? I didn't know. I didn't know I didn't know. Which, I mean, having walked through this myself, that is such a weird, hard time. It's like, you know, it's coming, but you never know when. And is it? Is it not? You don't know. Yeah. But by this time, we had done this four or five times. Yeah. So I get there. Still not understanding, like, this is happening. So was everybody there, her kids there? Like, who was all there? Everybody was there, and we had a, a meeting with the doctor, and he basically said, they never really told me what she was dying of. Like, if somebody says you have cancer, or you're having heart problems or stroke or something, they couldn't tell me anything. He was basically saying, like, she's at the end of her life. Mm-hmm. It's old age. And they had her like sedated where she could talk, but it wasn't, she wasn't like totally coherent. And they pulled us out in the hallway. And this doctor was explaining like what our next things were to do. And he said that her kidneys were starting to shut down, which, you know, that set me off into crying and like, what does that mean? And he said, it's basically old age. Like, we're all, we're all going to die. I remember my aunt Glennis was so upset and started talking about pink slime and <laughs> do you know what pink that is? Pink slime? What are you talking about? It was, uh, I don't know, during that time, there was a controversy about something people, the meat people were doing, they were putting this pink slime on it to make it look like it was more red and that was causing cancer. And Glennis was like, I'm no more meat for me and, you know, all stuff. And I was like, Glennis. I've never heard of that. Even if you never eat pink slime or eat meat again. Still, at some point, you're going to die. We're all going to die. It's part of life. We're going to die. But the doctor came out, and he gave us two options. He said we can either do critical care or comfort care. And we didn't understand what that meant. And he said critical care is basically she's going to have to go on dialysis immediately, and she'll be hooked up to machines, but she's still going to die. But comfort care means we'll move her over to hospice. We'll keep her comfortable and it will be a transition into the end. And I immediately, like, like freaked out. Like, y'all are not putting her on dialysis. Like, Granny would not want to be on a machine. She wouldn't want any of that. I've seen 
I saw steel magnolias where they put, <laughs> you know, where they were putting swords in your arms. Yeah. And I just couldn't stand the fact of thinking that she would be going through that. But we were in a weird place because I don't have a say because I'm I'm her grandchild. So I didn't have any valid say, but I was still going to make my say be heard, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But my Uncle Ronnie, who's her oldest son, I was so happy. I'm just so thankful that he was with us that day because he, like, stepped up and was like, I'm going to be the man here. Because usually Glennis took charge of everything with Granny, but we needed a man to, like, lead us through that process. And it was hard. It was hard. But, uh, you know, my dad was there, but he's not a take-charge kind of guy. <laughs> he's just going to go with the flow kind of. My Uncle Ronnie pointed at him. And pointed at Granny on the bed and said, "If that was your mama and they're lying on the bed, what would you what would you do if that was your mama?" And the doctor said, "I would put her on hospice and do the comfort care." And then everybody started crying, and it was just this big deal. And then that's because everybody knew that was the right decision. It was what we we're supposed to do. But even like to this day, my aunt Glennis struggles with that, that we do the right thing. I'm like, she was going to die anyways. She's going to die. This brings back so many, I'm not going to like <sighs> shift subjects too much, but so many memories with my mom and my dad, honestly, and my pop even. But like just how, I don't know, like I feel like. When you're at a point that you're just prolonging some suffering, yeah, and knowing, even though, but there is such this like pull to like keep your people here, which I get, but you, you know, can't. It's such a painful, painful decision and process. It was rough, but we decided, or they decided, because technically I didn't have a say, that we do the comfort care, and then we all went back in. Spending time with Granny, and she was like, she wasn't unconscious, but she wasn't totally conscious. And she wasn't opening her eyes, but she was talking to us with her eyes closed. So she was resting. She was like at peace. We didn't tell her the conversation that we had. But my Aunt Denise just started asking questions, and Granny started going through this, like, I don't know what it was. It was just, I think Denise initiated the questions, but once she started... <laughs> Granny started talking about all her kids. And so it was beautiful. We all just gathered around her bed. And she started, like, doing, like, I don't know if it was a blessing or what she was doing to her kids, but she was telling us what each one was as far as her six kids. And so she said, like, you know, Ronnie was the most, uh, I forget what she said about Uncle Ronnie, but then about my dad. (laughs) This was so funny. She said, James Keith is the most plain. And, you know, they called him, his name was James Keith Jones, but they called him James Keith. They called him by his first and middle name. And she said, James Keith was the most plain. <laughs> and we were like, okay. <laughs> like, what do you do with that? Yeah, let's but then, try to spin that in a more positive way. <laughs> well, no, but when we got back in the car, my dad was really bothered with that. And I said, Granny loves you. She wasn't saying you're plain. She was saying you didn't need all the extra. Like, you're simple. And she appreciated that about you, and I believe that she did. And so he he was good with that. But then she said, Ricky's the most creative. Roger's the most loving. Denise is the most like me. And then she said, Glennis is the most like her daddy because they both so stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, JJ's the most sincere. And my Aunt Denise said, hold up. We ain't talking about grandkids. We're talking about your kids. He's your grandson. We're talking about your kids. And Granny said, no, he's my youngin'. Mm-hmm. And that meant... I don't know, that meant so much to me. But then when we were in the car on the way home, my dad was like, you know, kind of, you know, Granny had six kids and had all the grandkids, but you kind of are like a seventh kid, just like, I was like, yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't know. But, you know, they tried to get her to say, to recant that. (laughs) And on her deathbed, she was like, no, no, he's my youngin. And um, it's true. But uh, we ended the night with that. We were getting ready to leave, and we're actually walking out, and I felt like I was supposed to go back. And I went back in, and I said, Granny, I want to pray for you before we leave. And she said, are y'all leaving me here all by myself? And I said, well, they're asking us to leave. You're in the hospital, but we're not leaving you here by yourself. 
because Jesus is with you, and he will never leave you. And it was like her whole body relaxed, and she like grabbed my arm and told me to pray. And then I prayed for her. We got done with that. And I just said, Granny, I don't know how to tell you what you've meant to me in my life. And uh, thank you for being the best granny in the whole world. And then her last words to me were, she said, no, baby, thank you for being the best JJ in the whole world. And we left. The next day they put her in the hospice thing. And I was trying to get back, but I had, you know, I was running a business. And so I was trying to wrap up everything. And, you know, Glennis was keeping me very updated on all things. Glennis didn't like it as she was so sedated when they put her in the hospice that she was basically unconscious after that. And I just went back to Birmingham and told my staff, like, y'all got to figure it out. I got to go. I don't care. I'm going to be with my granny. And so I got back over there. It wasn't a hospital. It was called a hospice center. I don't even know. what. I've never seen another one like it. But it was, they had large rooms, they had a patio. They had places for us to sleep. There was a, a yard outside where you could, it was neat, I guess. But I spent... Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night with Granny. And nobody in my family like told me that they expected me to do that. But I kind of felt like everybody else has got kids and a family, and I'm going to be with my Granny. That's all I know. And Saturday night, we had ran to get something to eat, and we were leaving. And I was walking out with my Uncle Ronnie and his wife, Estelle, and their daughter, Carolyn, who's my cousin, she looked at me and she said, J.J., you don't have to stay here. And I said, what do you mean? She said, you don't have to stay. And I said, well, I know I don't have to, but she never left me. <laughs> so I'm going to stay. But then the next day was Sunday. And you know how I am when I start getting aggravated with stuff? I started, like, questioning, like, what am I do- I can't just be here forever. And Glennis was there, and I told her, i got to make a decision. i got to figure out what i got to do. I want to go. I don't want to leave, but I need to get back to Birmingham to check on, you know, just making sure things are going the way they need to go. And Denise came, and she was like, y'all need to eat. you got to eat. You need, you know. So I'm going to take you and we're gonna take y'all to lunch. And so we said, okay. And we were walking out. Glennis stopped one of the nurses. And Glennis is kind of like you where she asks all the questions. Mm -hmm. And I wish, I've actually learned to ask more questions than I used to. But Glennis is going to make sure all the questions are asked. We know everything. and (laughs) You know all the things, kind of like Haley Jones. (laughs) But uh, we stopped the hospice nurse and was talking to her in the hallway. And she said, I've been doing this for 18 years. And what I'm getting ready to tell you, if somebody would have told me this before, I would not have believed it. But just hear me. And she said, they leave when they want to. They're not going to leave till they're ready, and they're going to leave when they want to. And then she said, is there anybody she's waiting to see? And we said, no. Um, like, there's been a flood of family and friends and even neighbors and neighbors from where she used to live with my granddad. Like, everybody had been there. And uh, she said, well, maybe she's waiting on somebody to leave. And I was like, I don't know what she's talking about. So we get in the car. We drive five minutes away. It was like a Ruby Tuesday or something. It was there in Alpharetta, Georgia. All the things were there. We go in. We sit down. It's me and my Aunt Glennis and my Aunt Denise. And as soon as our food comes, I get a call from my cousin Cassandra. And she said, come back. You got to come back. And I forget. One of them was like, no, let's finish lunch. And I was like, I'm going back. I don't care what y'all are doing. I'm going back. And when we got back, there was something going on at the front. Like, I don't know what it was, but you couldn't get in fast. And I knew that if you went around the back, you could go in through the patio. Mm -hmm. And I um, I ran around the back and went through the patio doors. And she was gone. (laughs) But my cousin Cassandra was holding her hand. And I remember later, Cassandra said that was the most special time I ever had with Granny. Like, I got to hold her hand when she was leaving. But I realized 
if that had been me, I, that wouldn't have been good. I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. Granny waited for me and Glennis to leave, and then she left. And it was, I believe that, I know it, and it was, it was crazy. But for me, like, seeing her there, knowing that it was, she was gone, I don't think I ever realized fully what she meant to me until that moment. Mm -hmm. And then my thoughts, the first thought I had actually surprised me, still to this day surprises me. I thought, Who's going to protect me now? Like, who's going to protect me now? Granny was my person. She was the only person in the world that I knew that was my person. And it was, uh, it was sad. It was rough. You know, we went through the, you know, all the days after that, planning the funeral, doing all that stuff. It was a beautiful celebration of her life. But I remember being at peace knowing that I knew where she was. And I, I knew. I didn't have a doubt that she had made the connection she needed, needed to make with Jesus. And as simple as that for any of us is just asking him. You know, that's how it worked with me. But uh, there was a part of me that came home kind of lost Yeah. after that. And I immediately got busy. We started finishing up, opening up Gardendale Kairos. But it was there was a definite uh hole. Yeah, you know, a loss. Yeah. And I mean I get that <laughs> so much. I remember they went to clean out they went to like finish up the end of all her life. My Aunt Denise called was like, What do you want? And I said, I don't want anything. She's already given me everything. And she had. Like everything I want I've already it was already in my house, so Y'all go ahead and fight over that last little bit. <laughs> do whatever you need to do. But um, a few weeks after her funeral, we were all together for dinner or something, and my Aunt Denise said, Mom, you know, you just get to the end of your life and you get that last life spurt. And she was saying that Granny got this, like, end of her life spurt. And I said, that's not true. I mean, it can be true, but for Granny had an experience with Jesus. That was her life spurt. And... I believe that. I know it. It was beautiful to watch. And for me, it was like an 88-year-old miracle. Mm -hmm. Like I saw something change in her that was beautiful and wonderful for her. But also for me, I know that I'll see her again. Mm -hmm. So there's the hope of heaven and eternity and knowing that my granny's waiting on me when Mm -hmm. I get there. (laughs) You know, she's probably talking with your mom right now Mm -hmm. about (laughs) all the things Team Jones. Mm Mm-hmm. But uh, how do we close this up? I mean, this was definitely a huge part of my story, like right before I met you. And then we're going to talk in the next episode. You had kind of the same experience with your dad, like dealing with loss. Like death is real. But. I think especially in this last year that a lot of people have experienced this kind of loss that unless you have experienced it yourself, you don't know. It's like you don't know what you don't know. But it definitely is the circle of life, and Mm -hmm. it's definitely when you experience um, when you experience real relationship and joy and, and just the highs of life through those relationships, you also invite yourself into experiencing the lowest of lows uh, when you're losing someone. And so um, it's hard. I mean, it's it's just what you explain. I mean, I think a lot of people can relate. They have their own story, Mm -hmm. but it's definitely a hard thing to walk through. But I really love in the Bible how they, how it, it, it feels like everything is through the lens of seasons and that, you know, like you explained to Lula when when my mom went to heaven, you know, there's a time to live and there's a, a time to die. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, a time to laugh and a time to cry. And that even when you're in a hard, hard season of grief, like not that you're ever going to forget, but there's always something that's passed along for the next season. 
That's yeah. invaluable. And I think of my dad, speaking of my dad, his favorite quote when he went to heaven very unexpectedly, and he would put it as a tagline on his emails, <laughs> was by the great theologian Dr. Seuss. And it was, <laughs> don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. I love that. That's beautiful. And we'll get into a little bit of that in the next episode because – when the time came when you and I got together, I was still, I don't want to say reeling, but I was definitely experiencing the loss of my granny, my person. And then, you know, it was during this exact same season that you went through the same thing, although very unexpectedly with your dad. And that really, when we when we came together, that made you so much more of a gift to me. And you actually said this when we were dating and in our wedding vows that you wanted to be my person. And (laughs) something about that, just knowing that my person had just left the world and now Jesus gave me another person, (laughs) was beautiful. But for my granny, her legacy, you know, all my kids have something from her. Lula May, her middle name is May because my granny was Sarah May Jones. Judah James. He's not like specifically named after her, but she named her son, my dad, and helped name me right with that name. And then Royal Grant, our our youngest son, they're actually twins, but he came out last. By two minutes. <laughs> our youngest son by two minutes. <laughs> but we named him Royal because her maiden name is was Sarah Royal. And my papa, her daddy, had a boy and a girl. And my granny's brother, Ellie Royal, he had three girls, so the royal name stopped with him. And but actually it hasn't stopped because now I have a son named Royal. It's named <laughs> after her family. I love that. Beautiful things. All right guys, well thanks for tuning in and we will see you next week. Bye guys. See you soon. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed the podcast. Written and produced by the Team Jones Company. Yours truly, James and Haley Jones. If you like what you've heard, you can subscribe to all of our podcasts. Download the Patreon app. You can get all of our content early and ad-free. Straight out of prison, the For Real Real, and Narrowing the Gap. There's a specialized feed there for all subscribers. You'll get downloads, updates, exclusive contents, live Q&As, and more. Or head over to teamjones.co slash podcast and click on the Become a Patron button. And I'll also put that in the show notes. Other ways you can support us is to like and share, leave a rating and review, and support our sponsors. They help us provide this platform for free. Listen on Apple, Google, Amazon Music, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and more. And thank you again for being a part of our story. Oh, I love that. out of these videos please hit the like button the subscribe if you never want to miss a recipe or anything i do hit the little bell and you'll get notifications